Today's special guest is Kelly Wright. Many of you know Kelly from his 15 years on the Fox News Network, where he co-hosted Fox and Friends Weekend and America's News Headquarters Weekend. In addition to reporting major news events across the globe for more than 30 years, Kelly is a multi-Emmy award-winning host and producer of America's Hope, which shares the stories of people who have turned tragedy into triumph and giving hope to those in despair. Beyond his extensive career in journalism, he is also a national recording artist, speaker, author, and ordained minister. Kelly is a prolific soloist who has performed at such historic venues as the Apollo Theater, the Cotton Club, and the Metropolitan Room, and appeared on programs with Shirley Caesar, Sissy Houston, the late James Brown, Jonathan Butler, and many more. Without further ado, Kelly Wright, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Chris, how are you? Thank you for having me on the program. No, thanks for your time, sir. It's great to see you again. Kelly, I think everyone knows you as a television anchor and correspondent. I expect fewer people, myself included, knew until now that you're an accomplished gospel singer and musician. So in journalistic jargon, let's make that part of your life the lead before we talk about your years of work in broadcast journalism. How'd your journey into gospel music begin and what inspired you to pursue a career as a gospel singer alongside your journalism career? Wow, thank you. You know, it's a great lead off because uh, gospel is near and dear to me since gospel music represents the good news. So as a young child growing up in my mother's home, my single parent mom, she was a piano player, a singer, uh, also a men's hairstylist. And my mother just had this incredible voice. And my grandmother played organ at our church in Hagerstown, Maryland. So I grew up around music. And mom loved uh, all kinds of song styles like Nancy Wilson and Johnny Mathis. And I grew up with that. And then she loved uh, Edwin Hawkins and Walter Hawkins. So gospel was always around my home. And consequently, it started with me uh, getting involved in, in uh, my local church, in the choir and singing. And I began to see the power of gospel music over uh, other forms of music. I like all genres of music, but gospel somehow just seems to tap into the spirit. Uh, and it does that because of who's elevated in the music. It isn't so much me uh, or the stars. It's actually uh, Christ. So that's uh, that's why I like gospel music. Good news in a bad news world. We need more of that right now, unfortunately. The last I knew, you had released four albums. Is that still correct? And tell us about how you choose the songs that you record and perform. Yeah, I, I think it's actually been, uh, I just added a Christmas album this past season and had the pleasure of uh, producing my very first Christmas special, which aired on NTD this past Christmas. And, and what a blast that was. We called it a joyful Christmas. And uh, uh, all of the albums uh, have actually been an album of purpose and statement. And there's been a reiteration of some of the old songs, making them sound new and fresh. Uh, there was one social song that I made, uh, one social album called Love, Freedom and Peace. And that was going back to the 60s and 70s protest songs to try to bring people together in love, freedom and peace. But then that also had a, a very uh, soulful gospel message and theme to it. I can't get away from that. That's who I am. And. And, uh, and and even when I was at Fox uh, doing Fox and Friends, my first debut on Fox and Friends as a co-host, was, as a guest co-host back then, was actually to, to sing a song. And I sang one of the songs from my album, uh, Believe, and, and actually sang that title track. And that was uh, uh, something that I, I enjoy doing. Your album before the Christmas album is titled Love Train. There's only one person on my team old enough to remember when the OJs released the <laughs> single Love Train in late 1972 and saw it go to number one in early 73. That's a great song, but it's not the song that's on your Love Train album. Tell us about that, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my good friend, Trey Corley, who is the music director for Mike Huckabee's uh, television show over on TBN. And of course, uh, Governor Huckabee is, uh, is a good acquaintance of mine. We work together at Fox. And I did a lot of shows with his uh, his musical band at that time. And so when he invited me to come sing on his program, he asked uh, Trey to, to put together uh, a, a, basically a, an arranger for a song for my album. Well, Trey and I got together and Trey said, hey, I've got this song called All Aboard the Love Train. And when he played it for me, I said, okay, we've got to do that. 
And, and here we are. We're actually singing all aboard the love train. So it is different uh, from the OJs, yet the theme is still the same. And many of us grew up singing this little light of mine in church. Your vision, your version is different. It's very upbeat. And please share the story of that one with us too, please. That's a, you know, I, like you said, Chris, uh, we grew up singing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. And again, going back to Trey, and I, I, I've got to give kudos to Trey. He's a multiple Dove winner. Uh, he's also a Grammy winning producer. He actually worked with Donnie McClurkin in addition to Mike Huckabee. But he said, I've got this real good arrangement for your song, This Little Light of Mine. And he played it. I said, okay, we've got to do that. And we changed the lyrics because I wanted to change the lyrics and make it more uh, uh, contemporary in terms of his message. But the message still holds true. No matter what you're going through, let your light shine. And that's, that's what we did. It's a really, I love the song. Performing gospel music often involves connecting with audiences on a profound level. What have been your most memorable performances in that respect and why? You know, <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going back to some of the, the people that I've met in various uh, shows that I've done. Uh, I'm going back to the Metropolitan Room. One of the things that I did at the Metropolitan Room, I fused, uh, infused uh, some of the old standards and some of the songs that many people relate to on the radio and that I put into gospel as well. And everybody would leave saying, I came in feeling uh, bad. I shouldn't say everybody. That's too, too much of a generalization, generalization. But many, many people that I spoke to at the end of the show, because I would go, it's like church almost. You go to the end and it's like the pastor waiting to greet all of the guests or all of the congregants. And at the end, they would actually come uh, my way and say, what I loved about your show is that I came in feeling bad and down. And now I feel so uplifted. It's uplifting. It's inspiring. That's what gospel music does. It connects to the soul and to the mind. And, you know, I, I attended a rock, poor Roberts University and, and they drummed into us that we have to appeal to the whole person, mind, body and spirit. And gospel music does that profoundly, as you've mentioned. What a great word, because the gospel music profoundly hits the person right between the eyes and in the depths of their heart and their soul to the point they want to move. They don't know why they're moving. They, they may not even believe as I believe, but they, they love the music and they love the message because people are hungry for hope. And that's what gospel music provides, hope, an exhilarating hope, not like Nobody knows the trouble I sing. Nobody knows but my Jesus. I'm going back to the Negro spirituals, but even that was uplifting because it allowed us to be able to express ourselves in such a way that, you know, the world might not get me, but God's got me. <laughs> and that is profoundly inspira inspiring. Are there specific artists, songs, or musical traditions that have influenced your approach to gospel music? Yeah, I mentioned a few through my mom, uh, uh, Edwin Hawkins, Walter Hawkins, uh, James Cleveland. These are really old school uh, artists who were kind of the trailblazers. Many people remember Edwin Hawkins and his song, Oh, Happy Day, which became a, a, a universal message really around the world. And, uh, and and then the song stylist, Nancy Wilson, what an incredible singer. She wasn't a gospel singer. She was more of a jazz singer in her own right a well-established uh, performer and entertainer. And of course, Johnny Mathis, which with his uh, smooth vocal stylings. But from a gospel uh, standpoint, it was always Edwin Hawkins in my house. Uh, Aretha Franklin, when she had her gospel album, she had to fight so hard to get that done because the record label was saying, oh, no, 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 Aretha, you're known as the queen of soul. And if you put this album out, it's going to destroy your career. If anything, it elevated her career and brought in new audiences around the world that had not heard her music before. And uh, she teamed up with um, a man who's known in, uh, in, in, in mostly uh, black music, uh, gospel music, is James Cleveland, who was known as the king of gospel uh, in, in uh, the black community. And it was just an, a phenomenal, phenomenal album that Aretha Franklin made. So 
those are some of the people that I adhere to. More contemporary people would be uh, Donnie McClurkin and C.C. Winans, incredible, incredible artists, and Hezekiah Walker. These guys are, uh, they're just so uh, humble and sincere because gospel music gets kind of a, it gets kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of weakened now because some of the stalwarts of gospel who held it up uh, to the highest esteem, like Shirley Caesar, like Donnie McClurk, and like uh, C.C. Wine as V.B. Wine is. Uh, some people now are just very, uh, like, I'm going to make this gospel record so I can be popular and make money. That's that's not the purpose of why I sing. I sing to, to help make people understand that there's something greater than themselves. And as one song says, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. And, and, and that's those are the artists that have influenced me. Well, and, and for our listeners, not our viewers, but the sign of your shoulder says, do right and fear no man. You talk about being humble, hope, profoundly affecting you like that. Those are clearly words to live by. Do you see any connections between your role as a gospel singer and your work as a journalist? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. And and I, I realize that some people in my profession, my the, the hat that I wear daily as a journalist, they they may disagree with me, and they have a right to do that. But I I live in America, and in America we have this wonderful thing called the right to free speech, the the right to um, have faith, and to express my faith. I, I think my music and my my uh, abilities as a journalist, uh, which I had to develop over the course of many years and had many people inspiring me and encouraging me. Uh, one of the things that they encouraged me to do is to never let my music go because it would be a form of expressing myself. It would also help me deliver uh, content in a conversational way and in a truthful way and in a humble way, and also in a way that people would understand that even though I'm reporting a story, it may be the most heartbreaking story on the planet, but I would pray that, that what they see in my report is, is this little glimmer of hope, even in the midst of despair. And, and gospel music and uh, journalism, <laughs> again, I, I know it, it's... Uh, it doesn't always come together in terms of mainstream media. Oh, you've got to be objective. And I, I understand that, respect that. But, uh, no, I, I like merging the two together. I think it's good for reporters and journalists to have other uh, influences in, the, in their life to help them understand humanity and report uh, on politics and, and, and religion and the economy and, and all of the things that we report on. You've obviously had success as a musician while answering the heavy demands of your journalism career. What advice do you have for aspiring gospel singers who are looking to make a meaningful impact through their music? Um, and there, so I would say, oh, that's a, a great question. I, I would have to say that there's a verse uh, in Philippians that says, never grow weary in well-doing. Uh, keep doing it. Uh, don't give up on it and and keep spreading that news, that good news, so that people can always hold on to hope. Uh, hope is something that uh, you can't always see. You can feel it. Uh, and also the peace that it gives and the deliverance that it gives for people facing hard times. So never let go of that if you're if you're pursuing a career as a gospel music artist. It, the other thing I would say is don't seek stardom. Uh, seek to elevate the person you're singing about, which is God, which is Jesus, which Holy Spirit. Praise and worship is what we like to call it in, in circles. And and then probably the, the most important thing is that uh, as you sing gospel music, understand that uh, that God looks beyond your faults and he sees your need. And you start singing the praises about the goodness of God. And, and that's, that's the best way I can explain. Uh, and I hope that inspires young people out there to so never let go of that God given talent and use it for God's glory. That is the main thing. There's a 2017 photo of you speaking to airmen assigned to the 105th Airlift Wing and others during a prayer breakfast at Stewart Air National Guard Base up in Newburgh, New York. Do you still speak to military audiences these days? 
And what has been your message when you do meet with them? I haven't spoken in a while since COVID, as a matter of fact. COVID really shut down a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, things that I did with music yeah, as well as with speaking. When I spoke to that particular group, my first and, and foremost thought was, these are men and women still serving in the military. They're active and there are some veterans there, uh, their families. I wanted to address them from the standpoint is that I care about what you do. I care about who you are individually and collectively and how you represent the United States of America. More importantly, I, I care about how you have to hold on to God on the front lines. I've covered the war in Iraq as a journalist, so I, I know what, uh, what men and women who serve in harm's way and serve in our uniform for the defense of this nation, for the defense of our freedoms, I know what they're up against. And when you think about it, Chris, less than 1% of Americans actually serve in the United States military. So I wanted to elevate God in them to let them know that God cares. Uh, and that he cares about what you do at home. He cares about what you do on the job. He cares about what you do on the battlefields, should you be called up to serve uh, in combat. And he cares about your family. And uh, we, we don't tell the men and women in the military enough. And I don't speak to them enough. And I need to get back to that because it was a uh, it was a great moment to be there. I've spoken for other military organizations, and, and every time I'm there, I just feel like I should be sitting down listening to you <laughs> about all that you've been through and the sacrifices that you've made just to serve this country. And, and, and I have to sing their praises because they really have a hard task, and they get paid very little. Uh, like our teachers in America. I don't want, I don't want to be political, but I think, uh, members of the military and teachers, it would be nice if they were paid a lot more. Couldn't agree more. Doctors and nurses too. Yes, exactly. So speaking of the military, you were in the United States Army when you started in journalism in 1977, almost 47 years ago. I hate to say that number. What, wow. mo what motivated you to join the Army and how'd you become interested in journalism? So I was in journalism. I, I actually, I started in radio at the age of 16 in my hometown of Bakerstown, Maryland. I had a show called Soulful Sounds, and I was playing all this uh, this great R&B music. And uh, I kept doing that even in college and carried it out from Hagerstown to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So when I joined the Army, <laughs> I actually joined by uh, accident. You know, you've heard the stories about that recruiter told me this. <laughs> and I had actually taken a friend of mine who wanted to join the military uh, to take his tests uh, to join the Army. And I decided I would sit around and wait. And uh, here I am in college, and the recruiter talked to me and showed me some of the things that I could do. And uh, I was in my junior year of college, and I actually joined. And I, to the surprise of uh, of uh, of the dean of students at, at uh Oral Roberts University and some of my classmates, what are you doing? <laughs> and so I served. I raised my hand and I served for uh, four years. And the journalism took off uh, in terms of my writing for Army newspapers at Fort Stewart, Georgia, and then in Germany, in Mainz, Germany. I even had an article, a couple of articles appear in Stars and Stripes. As you know, that's a uh, quite a respected newspaper within the military, so I was blessed to do that. I covered the the visit of Pope John Paul uh, to uh, to Mainz. He actually had visited Germany, and I remember standing in ankle deep mud, <laughs> taking photos of the Pope uh, going through the crowd in his Pope mobile, and then the next day, as this young kid, not even realizing how much history I had recorded. And before I got out of the Army, um, General Norman Schwarzkopf had become our commanding general there in Mainz. And, uh, of course, years later, he would go on to, to be the leader during Desert Storm. I got chills when you're talking about taking pictures of the Pope, so I understand what that moment must have been like. It was quite a moment. 
Serving as a journalist while in the Army certainly must have presented some unique challenges for a reporter who has to answer to assignment editors and news directors and also be accountable to the brass. Was that a bouncing act when it came to sensitive stories? And if so, how'd you handle that? Yes, yes, yes. The chain of command is something that uh, is ingrained when you become a soldier. And uh, because I was attached to a public affairs office and still had to serve uh, my, my main uh, 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 duty station, there was always some sort of tug of war going between my senior officers about what well, we want right over here. No, rights uh, attached to public affairs. He's going, they'll continue to write newspaper articles and it was continue to do some freelance radio. So it was, uh, it, it became quite a painful dance at times. Um, and when I got out, I was happy to get out for <laughs> my honorable discharge, a good conduct medal. But I, I learned a lot about how to, how to compromise and and really uh, understand what the mission was. And the mission was always about training, making sure we were ready for us, uh, regardless of what uh, role we were playing, whether it's a journalist or uh, ground surveillance radar or combat support, military intelligence or chaplaincy. We still had to be prepared uh, for that day that we may have been called up for to serve in, in harm's way. You went on to local stations in Raleigh, North Carolina, and Norfolk, Virginia, which is home of Naval Station Norfolk, the world's largest naval complex. Now, did your Army service help you there, or did the Navy folks give you a hard time? You know, it, there's something about Spree de Corps. Uh, and because I was working as a journalist and I was doing all, you know, a lot of great stories about the U.S. Navy, and the Army is just up the road from there as well. So I, I really didn't have a hard time. I got along with the the admirals, as well as uh, the ensigns and the uh, um, uh, so many other uh, military members in the Navy. Plus, in my church, I had a lot of Navy guys. And, uh, and, and, and actually, I, after I got to meet a lot of them and to find out what kind of duty stations they had around the world, I, I kind of thought, well, maybe I should have joined the Navy <laughs> <laughs> and sailed the seven seas. Sounds like you guys have a uh, have a good deal going on here. You go to all these uh, different places, and so that was that was really. I had no trouble with the, the Navy at all. In fact, my my pastor uh, had been uh, in the Navy for many years before he became uh, the pastor of Open Door Chapel there in Virginia Beach. But I love the military presence in uh, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Hampton Roads, and and, and where I lived actually. Uh, after after serving there for so many years as a journalist, we used to have uh, planes flying over our uh, our home, and it would shake <laughs> the, because we were close to uh, uh, Naval Base Oceana at Damnick. And every time we would see that or see them flying across the uh, the horizon of the ocean there at Virginia Beach, we we had the habit of saying, "There's the sound of freedom," and, and we still. You know, that that was just a beautiful sound, the sound of freedom, those jets flying by, realizing that they're that they're uh, out there to protect and defend the United States. Every broadcast journalist dreams of joining a national news network. How did your transition to Fox News happen in the early 2000s? Well, that was an answer to prayer, actually. Uh, <laughs> I had worked at Wavy TV and Fox 43 and. I, I had just returned from Africa where I had an incredible experience reporting on uh, uh, African President uh, uh, Matthew Carrick, who is deceased now, but he was the president of Benin, and Gerald Rollins, who's also now passed. He was president of Ghana. These two nations had come together to apologize for the misdeeds of their ancestors in perpetuating the transatlantic slave trade. And so consequently, after embarking upon that trip and returning, I, um, I met Britt Hume at the president's prayer breakfast. And I, uh, briefly introduced myself. And as, as, uh, as time went on two years later, because of Britt's influence at Fox, I ended up being there. I got this call out of the blue. I will never forget. I was actually editing a story on my second trip to Benin, West Africa. And I was, at CBN with one of my closest friends, Hugh 
uh, uh, Key Austin, who's now uh, no longer with us, but he saw me get this call, and it was a message from then Vice President of Fox News, Kevin McKee, saying, hey, we understand you're a good friend of Rick Humes, and we'd like to fly you up to New York to talk to you. And I looked at the phone and listened to the message. I played it for Keith and Rick Hume, I only met him once. I, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, three days later, I had the position uh, as a reporter out of D.C. And then began my uh, career at Fox News. What stories of yours stand out to you as defining career moments? It would have to be uh, the Iraq War. Uh, finding hope in the midst of that despair, picking up the phone and calling uh, Rick Hume and saying, hey, you know, I see something different over here. I know we're, we're engaged in this uh, awful war, but I see a lot of Iraqi people, men, women, and children, running towards U.S. soldiers dressed in full gear, full battle gear, yet embracing them and thanking them for freeing them from uh, the stronghold of Saddam Hussein. And, uh, and then I did a, a series for them called Noble Cause, which focused on the coalition of the willing forces and their humanitarian efforts in the midst of war while they're at the, the tip of the sphere and on the front lines engaging in a war and against a growing insurgency they're still looking at the humanitarian needs to be met and meeting those needs, going into the homes uh, of people living in squalid conditions and seeing the, the faces of moms and, and dads and the children embracing soldiers who are delivering food, necessities, uh, supplies, uh, school supplies, um, clothing. We were doing that, but no one was telling this story. We were talking about dropping a bomb here, having a fight here in Fallujah, fighting in the Joss and dealing with the insurgency and, 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 and still looking for Saddam Hussein because he hadn't been captured at that point. He was captured uh, about uh, two weeks before I, I departed and came back to the United States. But I would have to say that that was a moment to actually see how in the midst of war, even though we were fighting against enemies, we could still find a way to love, serve, and even pray and break bread with enemies. Uh, the other story that, that looms large, uh, if, if you don't mind if I uh, add that, would be that story that I did in Africa that ultimately went on to... Uh, really put something different in my life, and that was the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, many people in America know about slavery. We, we don't always like to talk about this birth defect that happened in our nation. But when Matthew Karakou, who had been a communist dictator, by the way, and when communism fell in this country, he turned his country around and made it a, a republic, a Democrat republic. And he just, and then he found uh, salvation in Jesus Christ. Okay, here's that, here's that faith coming in again, in the midst of news. And uh, the pastor who led him to this conversion to believe in Christ uh, actually uh, met me in Portsmouth, Virginia, along with a couple of American pastors, and said, "You must take this trip." I said, "Yeah, but I won't work for a network. I can't give you the the big bang that you're looking for." And I will never forget Ramain Zanu, who is the, the pastor. He said, never despise humble beginnings, Kelly. All right, so I'll pray about it, see if we can make this happen. So we did. We went to Africa. Here's what happened, Chris. I got to see, I was there for two weeks, I got to see the landscape of how diabolical the transatlantic slave trade was. How Amazon women would fight for uh, many of the kings and queens of Africa, they would go out and capture uh, people, bring them down through a trail of tears, then send them off to ships waiting to take them to parts unknown. Uh, what Karakou did was brilliant. He said, we must apologize for the misdeeds of our past in order to move forward into the next century. This was 1999. 
So I want to truncate this story. I got to see what they went through, how diabolical the trade was, how dastardly this deed was. And when Karakou apologized, he said this in front of descendants of slave traders, merchants, uh, and slaves themselves. And he said, I have to apologize to you for this dastardly deed inflicted upon humanity. And my ancestors, while they didn't initiate it, they perpetuated it. I want to apologize and seek your forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, you couldn't hear anything except people whimpering, some people crying, black men, white men, women, children. And at the end of that, uh, I had a follow-up meeting with him along with a couple of uh, representatives of America, including Tony Hall, by the way, who was still in Congress at the time, uh, as well as Senator... Um, uh, the name is Kate, Senator Inhofe of uh, Oklahoma. But I asked President Kerry, he said, now that you've made this apology, what do you want me to tell America? And he looked at me and said, you must tell America that they are a beacon of hope. And I said, okay, I get that. More specifically, since you've apologized for the transatlantic slave trade, what would you have me tell African Americans? And Chris, this blew me away and said, you must tell African-Americans to never see yourselves as victims, but as victors. We see you as being the modern day Josephs who helped build the global economy we enjoy today. Well, knowing the Joseph story, I fell off my seat saying, oh, my God, that would revolutionize how Americans see themselves. So uh, when I got back, I immediately went to Jamestown and I asked the curators of our first settlement in America, this experiment called America, could it have worked without the African uh, having some input? And they all shook their head and said, no way. This would not have worked. The African knew something about cotton and tobacco. And England began to realize, so oh, there it is. That's how we grow. And, of course, it became... Sinister over the course of time, human nature being what, being what it is, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia turned it into a chattel slavery, well, which shouldn't have happened, but it, that is human nature. <laughs> and uh, we've, we've gone through a lot in America, and I think we will uh, overcome those uh, vestiges of the past, uh, especially if people can see themselves in the light of Matthew Caracou, uh, a man of faith who really believed in the power of God permeating politics and society to make people feel whole. And that's what we're missing right now, wholeness. It's not been lost on my ears, and hopefully the listeners as well, the amount of times you mentioned the word hope. And it's the name of your show, America's Hope. And you mentioned America being a beacon of hope a couple of times. That's what we need right now, and that's what this show is all about. So I appreciate you weaving that into the narrative throughout this. And so it has not been lost on me. Let's talk about another story you covered. You once had an exclusive interview with OJ Simpson after he was acquitted of murdering his wife and her friend. What was that experience like and how'd you make that happen? Oh, wow. Well, uh, I was working at WRAL at the time uh, and uh, I love the people at WRAL. It's a powerhouse station throughout the state of uh, North Carolina, the good old Tar Hill state. And Bill Cherry, who uh, who was a, a noteworthy uh, publicist, contacted me and said, "Hey, I'd like you to invite. Uh, would like to invite you down to the Bahamas, uh, and we think we're going to have O.J. Simpson there." This was fresh at, uh, off the heels of the trial. I said, "You got to be kidding me!" You know, and uh, he said, "Yeah, he's he's actually going to be there." And I I would have to look back on that experience as being surreal. The people in Nassau, Bahamas, idolized O.J. Simpson. They revered him as a hero, as many people in America had done until um, until that trial, until the death of uh, Ronald, Ron Brown, since uh, Ron, Ronald uh, Goldman. I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember the names, and, and Nicole Simpson. So we all saw the trial. We all saw Johnny Cochran, and we we saw the verdict. Uh, so I, I'm interviewing O.J. there, and I'm thinking, this is really happening. I'm interviewing this guy. And I asked him, I said, how do you sleep at night knowing that uh, you have this 
on your back that you will always be seen by some as a murderer. And how do you sleep at night knowing that you're acquitted? Are you looking for the killers? And the, the obvious questions. And and what was surreal about it is to see O.J. walk through a, a gauntlet of well-wishers and the the media crush. <laughs> and I, I, I left there thinking, how do I put this story together, knowing that it's going to bring offense to so many people who have experienced domestic violence, uh, and yet knowing it's a powerful story about a hero, a fallen hero, and how does he get his life together? I met his, uh, his oldest daughter, and of course she was delighted to see her dad free. But that was, uh, as I look back on that moment, that was an incredible moment and trying to find, trying to find hope in the midst of that. And yet all I could do is walk away from saying, I don't know if this guy, I I still don't know if this guy did or didn't do it. Uh, Of course, since then, the public uh, has weighed in on that. The public always weighed in on it. And OJ has had his own uh, issues since then. Um, uh, But that's something between he and God. But for me and that story, I wanted to make sure that I I told his side of it and told the other side of the story and uh, got beat up on it because of the domestic violence issue. And we expected that. And, and what was, what was painful for me is that I'm, I'm a defender of, of women uh, when it comes to domestic violence. And, and I've always been a strong proponent to stand up against that. And in interviewing OJ Simpson, uh, for that one moment, people thought that maybe I had abandoned them. That wasn't, that wasn't the fact at all, but I, here was this guy in the trial of the century and I interviewed him. Uh, and it was, it was quite, quite an interview. In 2017, you joined a lawsuit with a number of your colleagues against your employer at the time, Fox News Network, alleging racial discrimination. You were the only black male anchor at Fox and you know that your own career had stalled because promised opportunities never materialized. In fact, you were primarily working the overnight shift. The suit was settled in 2018 and included agreements from both sides not to discuss the case. So I realize that you might not be able to talk about details, but can you share your decision-making process behind joining the lawsuit and what led, what led you to take that step? Well, looking back on that, I'm a lot, I would say that I'm older, wiser, and looking back on that, uh, what I have done it, uh, I would have done it differently. I believe in the power of prayer and none of us are perfect on this planet. We're all sinners saved by grace. And while I had some strong issues that have been going on uh, behind the scenes that I won't get into and seeing what was happening to other people, I would have liked to have solved that and settled that. You know, one of the things that I've learned, Chris, is that uh, we will be remembered for, one, the problems we create, or the problems we solve. I would have liked to have seen a problem that had been created there solved by my utmost faith in God. And there's a verse that, that in, uh, in Joshua, God is telling Joshua, don't look to the left, don't look to the right, but keep your eyes on me. Pray and meditate on me. And I think for that one fleeting moment that I went through that with Fox, it was a painful battle. Uh, it was like a going through a divorce, uh, heartbreak on all sides. I'm, and I, I'm still broken hearted over it because it wasn't supposed to end the way it did. Um, I still have a lot of love and respect for so many people who are still working there. and Others have gone on. Of course, as a network, they've seen their set of troubles, but as an individual, we all see our set of troubles. Uh, and, uh, I, I extend, uh, uh, just my heartfelt, uh, appreciation for what they helped me do with developing, developing my career and, uh, do, uh, look at them and pray that they will always, uh, survive and overcome whatever they're going through. Uh, individually and corporately. For me, I got nothing but love for people there. 
And uh, forgiveness is something, something that, uh, that we need to exercise more of. Raising concerns about racial discrimination within a prominent news network is a life-changing undertaking. What impact did your involvement in the lawsuit have on your career and your personal life? And how did you manage the stress and pressure? Well, I, look, I think it made me stronger, wiser, uh, and more introspective looking at myself saying, uh, you know, as I said before, we're all sinners saved by grace. I've, uh, I've had my own shortcomings as, as a man, as a human being. And I think uh, what, what I'm reminded of right now is when Jesus was confronted by all the, the politics and the politicians saying, this woman right here, she committed adultery. And now they captured her in the act. Where's the man? <laughs> but they brought the woman for it. And, and Jesus is just looking at the, in the, in the ground, he's drawing in the sand and he says, uh, Whoever's without sin cast the first stone. When I look at racism in America, and I look at the the problem of racism, it's not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. It's also not a race problem, it's a grace problem. And from my own personal experiences of what I've been through, I've learned to practice what I preach and trust more in God. Now, I learned it the hard way. A lot of people were hurt. I was hurt. And as I said, was the problem solved or has it still been bubbling under the surface? And it's not just that network. It's all networks. It's all of us. It's the network of humanity in America. If we get back to the to the essence of what Dr. King was talking about. He said, we got to learn how to, to, to live together as brothers and sisters or perish together as fools. And we have to come to that table of brotherhood in order to do some good. So I pray that, that the experiences I've been through will allow me to be one, teachable, reachable, and forgivable, and then do extend the same things to others so that we can find that common ground for the common good of all people in our society. Because God knows we need it. We need to stand together and, and overcome it together. And uh, there, there's adversity out there, but there's also the hope that prevails. Do you feel that your case contributed to discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion within the media industry and beyond? Oh, absolutely. I, Look, it's not just my case. There were uh, 12 other people involved. And uh, again, I can't get into the issues of it. But I think it was it was something that that made corporations uh, see uh, themselves and look at how they could change and how they could become more uh, more cognizant of some of the uh, the cultural divide and racial divides that we have and, and really broker better relationships among everybody uh, from all walks of life. Uh, I think history will look back at that and, 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 and history will have, people will have their own uh, perceptions about what happened, their own judgments about what happened. For me, since I was there, I know what happened. <laughs> And, and yet I'm limited in what I can say. I, I will say that the greater good that I seek is for healing, uh, for dialogue, for reconciliation, restoration, redemption. That only comes through Christ. You know, I, I can go to any court in the land, but there's a higher court that I have to answer to. There's a judge that I have to answer to, and that judge is God. Um, and so I, I can no longer look back at my past and, and think that could it have been differently? Should I question myself? I took a stand. I took a stand for what I believe to have been the right stand to take. But again, because I love people and, and, and really don't want to hurt, I don't want to hurt anybody. And I, I know I've, done that. So I, I would rather reach out and work a different way. 
through dialogue, through hard work, uh, through restoration. But sometimes, sometimes humanity gets messy. That's an understatement. But I'm glad that I serve a God who understands that in the middle of my mess, he has saved me from that, made me a messenger of a better message, and that's love, freedom, and peace, and forgiveness on all sides. The news business has undergone drastic changes over the years from who, what, when, where, why objectivism to explanatory journalism in which reporters have been trained now that they have a responsibility to tell us what a particular news story event means. You've been in the profession for many years and seen that change. What's your perspective on today's approach to journalism? Well, look, now we, now we have journalism because of the, uh, the fact that we've had, we have so many outlets. Uh, we have, I never thought I'd see the day where we talk about mainstream media, and then we talk about media on the left, media on the right. Um, and then independent media. So journalism 101 is that we always strive to the objective and tell our story and be fair and balanced. There's a Fox uh, <laughs> moniker for you <laughs> that I uh, can never get away from because there is something about being fair and balanced. And being fair is that you're listening to all sides. Balance is that you're allowing both sides to speak. But I think what's happened because of the politics in our in our world today, uh, especially in our country, the divisions that we have politically and culturally and racially, um, we find that people are talking at each other from different silos. And and as journalists, we're also human beings. We get caught up in trying to report everything and being all things to all people. I think the bottom line is that we must always be the truth and report on the truth. And yet we see that the truth can get shaded and covered up by the editorial judgments that we bring to the news cycle. Uh, now with my show now, I'm more of a talk show host than a, than a journalist. Uh, and, and so uh, some of my uh, my perceptions and my feelings, and just like we're talking now, we're, we're talking who am I as a human being? Uh, and some of that obviously comes through America's Hope with Kelly Wright. It was designed that way for me to have a, a talk format, to talk to people about um, issues that they're going through and then finding out where they are, who they are, why they do what they do, how they do it. And uh, by the way, if they want to talk about their faith, allow them to discuss it without any Without any judgment or pushback, and 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 being very uh, unafraid to let them share their faith, I think that really makes a huge difference in someone's life uh, because it allows you to get up in the morning and face the day, face the challenge with something extra to help you get through the hard times that you're going to face, and then also to go to bed at night. You know what? Uh, yeah, I talk about hope a lot because I remember a former Navy SEAL. Uh, when I was at Foxy, I remember him calling me up one to eight, said, the decorated uh, uh, guy, veteran, he says, I can't watch news anymore. I said, what's wrong? And I knew what he was going to say. He said, well, I go to bed angry. And then I wake up angry. I said, you know how that makes me feel, Kelly? And I have an arsenal of weapons in my home. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, that's not a good thing. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, he says, yet when, and, and this is nothing about me, but he, he knew me personally. He said, when I watch you, because I know you, I know that there's some hope out there. And so all I wanted to do uh, with America's Hope is to allow that former Navy SEAL to go to bed with hope and to wake up with hope and to face the day with hope rather than anger and fear and uncertainty and doubt but to give them something that's positive, joyful, inspiring, and and saying, no matter what you're facing, you could be on rock bottom, but understand that when you're on rock bottom, there's a God right there to lift you up. And, and if someone finds something wrong with that, okay, you're entitled to believe that way. This is America. 
but I'm going to keep trusting that hope will prevail and that God's plans for us, no matter what we're going through, is not for disaster, but for a future and a hope. And as I've said many times, I look at the landscape of America politically and racially, and I keep saying we're better than this. But in order to be better than this, that means we have to take the good and make it better, take the better and make it best and never let it rest. The good, better, best, keep striving to make it the best that we can be. We're still, we're still trying to become a more perfect union. This is still an experiment based on the U.S. Constitution that draws its values and insight from our Judeo-Christian principles. Uh, and yet there are people today who would even question that and what the founding fathers had purpose to do. But I got to give credit to the founding fathers for looking into themselves and praying to a God to get guidance so they could write a document that still, um, if we follow it correctly, can still help us as a nation. Kelly, we've got about 90 seconds left. And I always like to have our guests take us to the close with something that gives them hope or offer advice to our audience to help them become less stressed, more content, and more empowered. I have something right in your wheelhouse. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you to share the secrets of your resiliency. So I will strive to, uh, to say that no matter what you're going through, put your faith, your hope, and your love on point. Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Never let love be vanquished, but let it help you. And love covers a multitude of sins, including your own, including my own. And then out of that, always have the, the strength to forgive. And, and then there's many things that we could accomplish in life and aspire to be in life. I think the greatest aspiration that we should have is to be kind to each other. And Kelly, spread God's love, freedom, and peace. Kelly Wright, it's an absolute honor to visit with you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Chris. And thank you to our audience, which now includes listeners in over 50 countries, for joining us for another episode of Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details and upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek Public Figure and on X at Chris Meek underscore USA. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place, with another leader from the world of business, politics, public policy, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.